Well, if you would, please open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1 as we're still going through this chapter. And we're going to come upon verse 5 of Ephesians 1, but I'll begin reading at verse 3, and I'm going to go all the way to the end of verse 6. So I'm just going to read to, to give us uh, a sense of the context and what the Apostle Paul is saying here. So he says in verse 3, as we saw last week and the week before, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. And the title of this is Trinitarian Salvation, that we're kind of going through a little series in chapter 1 here. So Trinitarian Salvation. And what we're looking on specifically is the Father's election. And this is actually part 2, because I was planning on originally to go through verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 in one, in one week. And uh, this is the third week on, and I don't even know if we'll get through it all tonight. Hopefully we will, because I do want to move on. There's so much more to see. But as it is with all scripture, there is just it's a deepening well. It just gets more and more rich. The, the more I study, the more comes to the surface of what we can look at. So with that said, let's hop right into it. Um, but I do want to say just a couple things before we, we look at the text itself. Um, and when we're looking at, at specifically these, these doctrines that are put forth in these verses, um, oftentimes what happens is we can fall into a little bit of a misunderstanding uh, and a little bit of a, even just a, a struggling to grasp the weightiness of the truth that's put forth in Scripture. It's not only here in these verses, but it's in other places as well, where there's just things that are talked about that are very hard to understand. One of those is like the book of Revelation. Uh, scholars and theologians throughout the ages, preachers have just been scratching their heads over, over that book. But nonetheless, we still have an idea of how to interpret that and interpret it quite accurately. A lot, of, a lot of that has to do with the way it was written. But here in Ephesians, right at the outset, Paul just puts forth very, very deep truth, very weighty. And as I said, we can oftentimes look over it so quickly or look over it so fast that we almost miss what he's saying and we fall into a level of ignorance. We misunderstand it. In fact, I would say that myself... I really haven't come to a deep understanding of these, of these doctrines, these truths talked about in these verses until about maybe a year and a half ago. So, I mean, there was a, a, a good year and a half period as a believer where I was just in a lot of darkness concerning this. It's just weighty. It's a weighty eternal truth. But further study will help. Further study helps us. We need to, to be diligent. We need to be Bereans. You know, the Apostle Paul uh, excuse me, not the Apostle Paul, but um, Luke chronicles in the book of Acts when the apostles are, are in Berea. Uh, it says that they were more noble than those of Thessalonica, and they studied the scriptures to see if the things that Paul said were so. They studied the word, and, and in fact, that really captures what your responsibility is as, as the congregants, as the, as the believers to whom I'm preaching. Your job is to listen and to hear and to analyze and then to go to the scriptures and search out to see if these things are so. In fact, that's discernment. That, that's, that's exercising discernment. When you can listen to a preacher or myself or anyone who claims to handle the word God and analyze that in light of scripture and make a choice as to whether this is something that is true or false. Whether they're, they're preaching the word or they're not. And so I would encourage you strongly to be uh, vigilant to be diligent in your study of Scripture independently and to take what I say on Sundays, Wednesdays, and Sunday mornings and grapple that and run home and, and study that. We need to engage our minds. We need to engage our intellect. And that's something that it has been, I would say, just so downplayed, especially in modern evangelical circles. In fact, I'm reading a book right now called... Uh, Charismatic chaos, and it's talking about the modern charismatic movement. And one of the biggest, one of the biggest 
things that is, is it's put forth in charismatic theology is the idea of worshiping God when, in a sense in which you disengage your intellect and disengage your mind. And you're just really, it's about your emotions and it's about an experience and about your feelings. When scripture doesn't talk about that, it talks about your mind, your intellect. We, we're to exercise wisdom and discernment. And so it's like that, obviously, when we listen to the preaching of the word. And by that, we will be grown in Christ's likeness. We will be grown in, in, in conformity to the image of Christ. It causes maturity. It brings about maturity. It cultivates maturity. In fact, in uh, 2 Timothy 2, in verse 15, and then I'm reading out of the King James because I like the way it words it here. And Paul exhorts Timothy. He says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's obviously given to a minister, a man who's called a ministry. But there is a general teaching here. There's a general, a general truth for believers, all believers, that we are to study to show ourselves as workmen of fruit and work women in the service of our Lord Jesus. God will be honored. His truth will be honored when we put to death um, fleshly indulgence and we engage the mind and we're diligent to study. And thereby we will honor the truth of the gospel. And we certainly need to pray for wisdom. We need to pray for wisdom. As James 1, 5 says, that if any of us lack wisdom, what are we to do? We're to ask of God, who gives all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to Him. So if we run upon something in Scripture that we ourselves are having a difficult time understanding, or perhaps having a difficult time accepting, let us pray to God for wisdom. I have done this even in recent months in my life, studying another topic that I won't mention at this moment. But it was something that was very difficult for me to accept in Scripture. It, it really was something that I knew if I accepted, it would probably cause me a lot of turmoil and hardship. But I had to come to the realization, it's not about my feelings or how, it's not about me. It's about honoring God and, and being faithful to the Scriptures. And so certainly there was a season of the Lord leading me through that. And he's done that, I'm sure, with all of us at points in our lives as believers. God desires to give us wisdom, brethren. Let us ask him. Let us ask him. And so also to note really quickly, so we understand again where Paul's coming from, from here in this book. We know Paul wrote this from prison in Rome to the church at Ephesus. And we had talked about last week a lot of the pagan idolatry that happened in Ephesus, and their, their low view of, of their deity, Artemis, extremely low view of sovereignty, and it was really foreign, the Christian God's sovereignty was really foreign to the Ephesian, the Ephesian pagan's mind. And then we looked at also, just kind of a quick overview of chapter 1 being that it breaks into two parts very well. The first part is, is concerning God's divine blessings in Christ. And then the second half is about Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. And in this first section of chapter 1, in verses 3 through 14, we see what I have entitled Trinitarian Salvation. That is, that salvation is by all three members of the Trinity. And the first part, if you look in verses 3 through 6, breaks into a nice section, which is concerning God the Father. Then verses 7 through 12 breaks up into its own section as well, and that is concerning the work of Christ. And then in verse 13 and 14, we see the work of the Holy Spirit. So all three of the members of the Trinity are in unison. They're in agreement and they're working to bring about something. They're working to bring about the salvation of the elect. And they accomplish it. We saw last week specifically in verses 3 and 4. That we have spiritual blessings in Christ. And then we saw in verse 4, Paul just unleashed the glorious doctrine of election. And we also talked about a little bit about the covenant of redemption and divine predestination. And we'll, we'll go back over some of that because it's always great to review. In fact, repetition brings about uh, memorization. When you hear something over and over, you will, you will automatically remember it. 
And so in these, uh, in these next two verses, verses 5 and 6, I hope to complete this unit here, this section, concerning the Father's work in salvation, and that is election. Father, the Father's work in salvation is to elect. Or you could say, it's synonymous, the term would also be predestined. But I just simply put election. So we're going to see two things. Verse 5, we're going to see that God has predestined us in His loving kindness. That's the first thing in verse 5. And we're actually the first... Uh, uh, we're actually going to look also at the beginning of, or excuse me, the end of verse 4, because we'll talk about that in a moment. And then the second thing we'll see in verse 6 is that God has predestined us for His own glory. So God's predestined us in loving kindness, that's verse 5, and God has predestined us for His glory, that's verse 6. So let's look at the first one. God has predestined us in His love. Now, verse 5 is interesting. Back in the Middle Ages, um, scholars went over... And they numbered the chapters of the Bible, and then they also did verses. They numbered the, the verses out. Now, none of that was there in the original languages. They're just written like books, not even broken up in chapters, just one linear thought. Uh, and so people come on, came around later on, like I said, and, and added these chapters and verses. And one of the, I would say, perhaps even the mistakes that was made here was they put verse 5, if you look in your Bible... It has, it'll have the number five right before the phrase, he predestined. It really needs to be before the phrase, in love. Because that's that, those two words, in love, that describes what he's doing in verse five, at the end of verse four. So, it's just a weird verse break that happened there. So, we're going to start there with those first two words. Because that is, the thought is, is what we're looking at. In fact, in my Bible, I use the New American Standard Translation. And... My Bible ends the this, uh, sentence that appears in verse 4 right before the two words, in love. So in love is a part of verse 5 in the sentence structure. So anyways, so it says in love. In love. This is God's motivation for salvation. This is God's motive for calling us to eternal life. It is because of His great love. The Greek word he, empl he employs here in this verse is something we actually are quite familiar with, if you recall, a few weeks ago, when we were going through our series of the fruit of the Spirit. What was the first one we looked at? It was love. And the Greek word Paul uses there is agape. It's the same word he uses here. It's this unconditional, eternal, undying love. It's not a love that would exist between a husband and wife, or two friends, or family members. It is a... It is a an almost an alien, a foreign love. It's something we've never really seen in our world. Because if you think about it, most all the love that we see is merit-based. If you're in a relationship with someone, and, and let's say one of the people in the relationship break it off, and the other one just moves on, it's a conditional-based love. Right? So you, you could use so many examples of human love. Is just, just, it's not as eternally faithful as this love of God. In fact, there's really no comparison. No comparison. Now, I have to say, this morning I was listening to the radio and the lady was talking about it. She was talking about, uh, and she used the Greek names and she went from the, when it was talking about love and the Old Testament, and it was a, and the best she could put it in, in terms for us, and she gave the Greek the name for it and all. Mm -hmm. And she said that it was a passionate love. It was the love that, like, you see somebody, oh, he's just great, I got you know, that type. Talking about agape love? No, talking about the, the love. Next, she said, but then in the New Testament, because she was trying to say where love fits into a marriage, and that women, because they are part of the curse and the fall, was that they would desire their man. I mean, that's what she was talking about. And she said, and in, in the Old Testament, that, that when Sodom and Moore and all those fell and everything else, they were using that passionate love which was not the everlasting love. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And she right. said, but when you went into the New Testament and you saw where it talked about husbands and wives, they used the agape love because you're not supposed to fall in love with the person for the way they look, but on being able to work together. So she was saying that in the New Testament, it did use agape with the marriage. Well, yeah, the, I'll clarify with that. So what happens is uh, the New Testament, when it uses it in a descriptive term, between husbands and wives. And the Greek word she was talking about is eros. That's actually where we get the word erotic from. No, it was actually something else because it was a two-word thing. Phileo? It was a two-word thing. It would have been the Hebrew. Oh, she's talking about the Hebrew. I'm sorry. She was in the Hebrew there and then she came into the So you're saying she's talking about a marital love in the Old Testament. 
in was Hebrew. described as the other. Yeah, yeah. And then in the New Testament, it's described, and she said, and you're familiar with the description, which is agape. Got it, got it. Yeah, so Paul, actually in Ephesians 5, which will probably take us a while, but we'll eventually get there. Uh, Paul says, husbands, agape your wives as Christ agape the church. So there is the imperative in the New Testament to love, and you're, you're right, in light of what Christ has done, there's this, higher, there's this higher level in which we've been called to love one another, especially husbands and wives. Um, it's this, again, like you had said, this, this self-sacrificing love. Um, certainly, I'm not all too familiar with Hebrew terms, so I couldn't, I couldn't think of top of my head which one she was using. But certainly, um, yeah, in the New Testament, when it talks about marriage, it gives that imperative that, we're, that husbands and wives aren't just to love each one another in this passionate, oh, just because whatever, they're providing something for the, the other, but a selfless, unconditional, undying love. Why? Because Christ did it for his church, the bride of Christ. Very good, that's right. So I want to look at a couple of aspects of this eternal love, and I won't go too deep in it because this a lot of this is almost a, a review of, of what we did a few weeks ago in our study of, of the fruit of the Spirit. But one of the things in relation to salvation, God's love for his people, I, I want to talk about a couple of aspects of it. Firstly, it is exclusive. It is exclusive. In Deuteronomy 7, you don't have to turn there, but God says to the Israelites, he says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And the reason that's profound is God is saying to them, out of all the peoples I have chosen, and in their day that there was just people group upon people group, all these nomadic, and it was it's much different than it is here in the United States now. People, and especially in the Western culture, intermarrying is so normal. You know, we don't even blink if we see an, an interracial couple. That's not a big deal to us. Back in the Middle Eastern culture, that was profoundly wrong. You, you're not supposed to intermix. Um, and a lot of religious beliefs around that, etc., etc. They wanted to keep it within their own tribe or their nation. So you had just a lot of separatism. So God's saying, I've chosen you, Israelites, and everyone else, I haven't. In fact, listen to what he says in verse 7. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor chose you, because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. You know, it's interesting the parallels between this and um, God electing his people to salvation. Because does God choose us because we have anything? Because we have any inherent value? No. We're just as evil as anyone else. He does it because he desires to show kindness. Verse 8, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. Verse 9, know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God. That's amazing. And then it says, he who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand, the thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. We know from Joshua 24, 11, that in Canaan alone, there were many people groups. The Amorites, the Hezrites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the, Gir the Girgashites, excuse me, the, Hivite, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Just, in, just in, the, in the local region of Canaan. That's not talking about the other nations surrounding Canaan. There were many people, and God chooses the least likely. The ones with the least inherent value. And when we look at us and we look at our own salvation, we think that's so true. We're nobodies. I am nobody. Truly am not. Yet God saved us out of His great love. Secondly, this love that God has is eternal. And this is something that's really captured in the original Greek. And so I'm going to go too deep into it. But it is never ending. And it's why is it never ending? Because it's connected to who God is. He's immutable. He's eternal. It was before all time. See, here's the thing. As we talk about predestination, we talk about election, when did this all happen? Not before, not when time happened. It was before time was made. This is in what we would say eternity past. Way back before time, before the foundation of the earth were laid. Before Adam and Eve were even a thought in the mind of God, if you will. Of course they always were, but you, you see what I'm saying. 
God set His love on us. And so because it was made in the eternity past, it will continue on for all of eternity. When time itself has ended, and everyone is in eternity, God will still have an everlasting, faithful, unconditional love for His people. In fact, I love what Jeremiah 31.3 says, and if you're ever discouraged, this is a text of precious consolation. And this is spoken to the Israelites, but for us New Covenant believers, we know we're engrafted branches. And so we are part of the people of God. This is for us. He says in verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And then listen to this. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. The Psalms are, I, I could go, when I was researching some verses to pull up on this, I, I just was overwhelmed by the, the data in the book of Psalms concerning God's love. Uh, Psalm 90, verse 2, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Why is that relevant to God's love? Because it, because He is love, His love is eternal because He is. Psalm 103, 17, the, but the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. It's all over Scripture that God loves His people to the end, that it will never end. That it will continue on throughout all eternity. In fact, I've really found what I call the, love, the everlasting love chapter of Scripture. It's Psalm 136. Just listen to this. Listen. In verse 1, Psalmist says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to God, oh, excuse me, give thanks to the God of gods, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His loving kindness is everlasting. To him alone, who alone works great wonders, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the great lights, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The sun to rule by day, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And I could go on and on and on. But I'll just go down to verse, uh, verse 26. He ends with saying, Give thanks to the God of heaven, for His loving kindness is everlasting. I think you get the picture that in every other line in this psalm, the psalmist throws in the phrase, for His loving kindness is everlasting. The psalmist wants, to, wants us to understand something. God's love for His people never ends. And then thirdly, is that this love is revealed in Christ. And the reason I wanted to highlight that is because if you notice the wordage that Paul employs in chapter 1 of Ephesians, it is laden with Christ. It's all about Christ. It's all going back to Christ. I mean, verse 4, he says, Just as he chose us in him, who is that Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we would be blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. And then in verse 6, we're, why, why did God do it? To, pray, to the praise and the glory of His grace, which He freely set upon us in the Beloved. Those three verses, in every verse, Christ is mentioned. It's all found in Christ. In Romans 5, verse 6, Paul says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having but now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. That's, that's the love of God. That is this agape love, and it is all in Christ. It's not outside of Him. Certainly not. John 3.16, one of the most well-known scriptures, that God so loved the world. He has an undying love for His people. And then I also enjoy what John writes in his epistle. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, he says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God, and such we are. I also want you to note about this love is something that we need to understand as Christians. And this is where our pride is thrown under the bus. This is where our pride is ground to dust. This is where our pride is all, it ought to be thrown into the garbage. 
And it is this. God is not obligated to give us this love. God is not obligated to give anyone this love. God is not obligated to give anyone salvation. The moment we think that is the moment that we view God as a, as a tyrant. That's when, our, when we begin to think that people are deserving of God's love and people are worthy of it. And people are worthy of salvation, worthy of being saved from their sins, and we're worthy, then we will view God as a tyrant. We'll view God in a horrible light, and we'll have a twisted view. In fact, like you listen, it's interesting, you listen to all these liberal theologians and liberal quote unquote Bible scholars, and they all talk about, man, the Bible, you know, the Old Testament especially talks about God. And he, the God of the Old Testament, he just seems so different than the God of the New Testament. And they even say, well, in sections of the New Testament, God is spoken of in such a horrible way. And they always talk about that God in certain places is projected in one way and another, and basically saying, well, I don't really know. <laughs> I really, they'll, they'll say, I really don't know what this God is. But they, a lot of them will certainly say, and they do this a lot, they'll throw the Old Testament out and they'll say, well, that God is not the God that I believe in. So they just reject it altogether. Why? What's wrong? What's wrong with their thinking? It's a lot of things, but I, I, I can surely uh, give you this. One of the things that's faulty in their understanding is man. See, really, these, these truths that we're going to look at, and we're going to, we have been walking through here in Ephesians 1, it all boils down to this. What is your view of man? What is your view of man? Do you believe that man is worthy? Do you believe that man can co can coordinate with God? Do you believe that, that man can cooperate with God? Do you believe that man can have any relation to the Most High? Whether good or bad. Well, certainly Scripture says he has relation, but it's all 100% bad. Bad, bad, bad. Not because God, because man, man's holiness. God does not owe anyone salvation. He's not obligated to give everyone, anyone, anything. There's no obligation there. In fact, uh, God says to Moses, this is one of the only times in Scripture where the Bible actually reports God speaking audibly, speaking out loud. And in Exodus 33, 19, God says to Moses on Mount Sinai, He says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Well, there's no room for me to say, but, but, but you got it. No. God is sovereign. God is, is the one who is able to, to show mercy and withhold mercy. And show compassion and withhold compassion. And that's his prerogative. In fact, a lot of believers will say, well, how come? How can God select me for salvation but pass other people over? Pass the ungodly over? Well, I'll give you this by way of an analogy perhaps to help you understand. Um, let's say, for example, we have ten people in a court, uh, let's just say courtroom. All ten of them have been convicted of the same exact crime. They were all, uh, let's say they even just did it all together. They were just corporately uh, broke into a store or something. They're all charged with the same exact crime. They all deserve to go to prison for, uh, for robbery, breaking an injury. Um, yet the judge decides in his gracious prerogative to pay the fines for five of the people. Just very random selection. Pay their fine for them out of his own bank account and let them free and the other five would go to prison. Now certainly none of us would say, man, that judge, that's just a weird judge. Why would he not help those other five ones? We would say, that's a nice guy to have bought the pardon for those five convicted felons. For those five guilty lawbreakers. We wouldn't say, why didn't he help the other five guys? And it is the same way with God. When we look at God's sovereignty over salvation, we, if, if our attitude is, but why, God, why don't you save these other people? If that's our attitude, then we will be left in a horrible state, a very troublesome state. But if our, if our attitude is the beatitude attitude, and it is an attitude of humility and an attitude of realizing how sinful man truly is and how, how sinful we are. That we, as the Apostle Paul said himself, I am the chief of sinners. Chief of sinners. Deserving of eternal punishment. You 
yet God chose to send His grace upon us, to, sh to shine the light of the glory of the gospel upon our souls. God doesn't know you. God doesn't know me. God does not owe the pagan idol worshiper out in India who's never heard his name. He doesn't owe him anything. He doesn't owe us anything. We're all the equal claim. We're all sin. What is, I love it. It's so simple. Romans 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There it is. In fact, this sense of entitlement is straight out of the pit of hell. This sense of entitlement. Surely it is. So let's move on to verse 5. Let's actually get into really the, the meat of this. He says in verse 5, the He predestined. He predestined. And this is where we're going to discuss, and as we've already been doing, we really talk only about the motive, though. We're going to look more of the actual mechanics of it. The doctrine of divine predestination. And firstly, I want to define terms. The English term for predestined is from Latin. And it's really simple, actually. It's simply just two words put together. The suffix pre, which means before. And then destin, or that's taken from destiny. It's your end. It's your purpose. It's where you're going to end up. So, quite literally, it's your predetermined end. In fact, you could say this is a predetermination, is what you could also translate the word to be. But underlying that layer of English is, of course, the original Greek the Apostle Paul employs. So what is he saying? Well, the same thing. In prarizo is the word he employs, and it literally, clearly translates to predestined, or to decide beforehand. I also want to just give you a little bit of a theological definition uh, and this is, this is actually relevant to us, especially as we'll be starting um, a series on the London Baptist Confession uh, beginning in August. In the London Baptist Confession, in chapter 3, in paragraph 1, it says these words. God has decreed in himself from all eternity, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably all things whatsoever comes to pass. Okay, so that's a very generic definition. So he's saying, uh, the confession simply reads, God in eternity past has ordained the ends to everything. That is, in very generic sense, what predestination is. There is no solo or maverick solar systems, planets, countries, states, governments, institutions, families, individuals, animals, insects, cells, or atoms. No, everything happens under the divine decree of God. Everything. And that leads us to the next point I'd like to look at, and that is the extent of God's predestination. How far does it go? Well, it, firstly, He does all things, as we just saw. Everything. Psalm 135, verse 6 says, Whatever Yahweh pleases, He does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all the deeps. In Isaiah 46, 10, God says through Isaiah that He is declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. How could God say that if He wasn't actively predestining the ends to all things? How could He say that with any, with any assurance? Man could come along and mess it up. But no, our God is in the heavens, and He does all that He pleases. It's all of God. In uh, Proverbs 20 as well, in verse 24, listen to these words. Proverb reads, man's steps are ordained by the Lord. How can man understand his way? I think it's interesting how he throws in the question. How, how can man? That's so profound. Because from our perspective, it's us making the choices. It's us, you know, for example, I mean, I'm going to choose to, Lord willing, walk out these front doors, go home this evening. That's me choosing from my perspective. But Scripture says that there is this, there is this paradox, there's this dichotomy. There's yes and yes. But there is a responsibility that people have. And, and obviously we make choices. But above that, who rules? God. Who's the king? God. In fact, that in Isaiah 49, God vindicates his sovereignty. In other words, he makes clear this. Very clear. In verse 8, he says, Drip down, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the earth open up and salvation bear fruit. And righteousness spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker. So in other words, he's saying, woe to the one who 
who asks me why I'm doing this. In other words, God, why would you? I don't want, I'm uncomfortable with the fact you're this sovereign. He says, an, earthen well, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? For the thing you are making say, he has no hands? Woe to him who says to a father, what are you beginning? In other words, he's saying, it. why would a son say to a father, why have you begotten me? Or to a woman, to what are you giving birth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and His Maker. Ask me the things which are about to come concerning my sons, and you shall commit to me the work of my hands. It is I who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands, and I ordained all their hosts. Total sovereignty over everything. It's an umbrella under which everything resides. Every, the entirety of the universe. In fact, uh, even Scripture talks about God being a king. In uh, Psalm 24, we see uh, Scripture describing that, and we even see in the, in the New Testament in Revelation, Jesus comes back as the conquering king. What is a king? He reigns over a monarchy. He reigns over a kingdom. And his decrees must be obeyed. Or what will happen? His subjects will be destroyed, thrown in prison, perhaps. So if kings on earth, when they make a decree in their kingdom, when they make that decree and it comes to pass, how much more the creator of all things, who spoke everything into existence, when he makes a decree, it will come to pass. No man can stand in the way of God. The second thing I want us to see concerning God's predestination, and this is something I, I think is interesting, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross is, God's prede is also a part of God's predestination. What do I mean by that? Well, it was something that God had not at the last moment, or when even in the, in the, in the garden, when the Satan uh, caused Adam and Eve to fall, that God was like, oh, got to think of something quick. Absolutely not. In fact, we looked last week at the uh, Council of Redemption. This is the whole plan of the world. This is the plan of the universe. There's a blueprint. Everything's following. And it's according to this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, this glorious message of salvation. In fact, you can say it's the greatest, as, as we just talked about a minute ago with Sydney, the greatest love story. Christ and the church. Christ and his bride. So one of the places I just want to take you, and you don't, you don't have to flip there, but in Acts 2, in verse, uh, verse 22, this is Peter preaching at Pentecost to the Jewish people. And he says in verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders, and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and knowledge of God. But listen to what he says in the second part of the verse. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Wow. That's a dichotomy right there. He says, okay, you did it, but God did it. God caused it to happen, but you also they're, they're, it's this reality where they're both side by side. They're like two railroad tracks. And we as believers have to stand upon both, realizing that there is a responsibility with men and their choices, but God, above that, is sovereign in His plans, bringing those things about for His own glory and His own honor. It's elsewhere spoken of in the book of Acts concerning the cross being preordained by God. But I don't want to spend too much time on that because I want to get to the third point, which is something that we need to spend a little more time on. And that is, the third thing that God predestines is the salvation of His people. Salvation of His people. And this is what the text is specifically talking about in Ephesians here. He's talking about salvation. Obviously, we know that from verse 30. And also, as we, as we go further into chapter 1, and then even as we enter into chapter 2, Paul's subject matter is soteriology, is the study of salvation. In fact, as we had looked at at the beginning, the main point of the passage is to talk, talk about the three members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, saving God's people. And so how does that play out? How does that look? Well, if you would, you now here's where I would like you to turn this back to Romans 9. We actually visited Romans 9 
it was two weeks ago, and then we even looked last week, and this is really the, the golden chapter for this whole idea of divine sovereignty. This is really where you're going to find all the answers to your questions, because actually Paul asks the questions for you. He inserts the questions throughout his argument. So I'll just begin in verse begin in verse 8 of Romans 9. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says, It is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Now he's talking about the Jewish people. He's saying, just because you're a Jew doesn't mean you're going to be saved. You have to believe the promise as Abraham did. And uh, there's a good parallel, parallel to that today as, as you know, uh, people who have family members who have grown up in church, or we ourselves perhaps grown up in church, just because you do that doesn't make you any more right with God. You've got to be born again. So that's what he's saying. Verse 9, he continues, For this is the word of promise. So here's the promise that was given to Sarah, or excuse me, to, uh, to Abraham. He says, At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand. Not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. So what is God doing here? So before these two twins are born, God has already predetermined their end. God has already predetermined what their life's content is going to be. And that's why in verse 12 we see the Old Testament quote where God says that the older is going to serve the younger. Which was totally opposite of what was the custom in their day. You know, to be the first born of a family in the ancient Near East, that was a great honor. And so for, for God to say the older one is going to serve the younger was against their custom and against their cultural background. But then in verse 13, we see something very, very, very profound. Verse 13, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And we think to ourselves, what? What's God saying? So God has, before, as we know from verse 11, God has looked upon these two people before they were born, before they hadn't done anything good or bad, and he is saying... I love Jacob, but I, I hated Esau. Now we say to ourselves, why? How could God say that? Well, we know this, that God has knowledge of the future, clearly. He has much more than knowledge of the future. And so what did he know about Esau, first and foremost? Well, he knew this. What would Esau do? Sin and rebel against God. So when someone sins, what do they invoke? Well, God's hatred. They invoke both the wrath of God. Psalm 5 and Psalm 11 tells us God hates those who do wickedness. Um, as I preach my, uh, I keep referencing this, but it's important to note, I preached that sermon on the first fruit of the Holy Spirit, fruit of love. And I talked about in that sermon that God has a love for all people. There's a generic sense in which God loves all people. But I do want to make note of this. The Bible also says God has a hatred for those who sin. There is, there is a sense in which God hates sinners. And I think that's very, I think it's very unfaithful to Scripture when preachers will oftentimes say, well, God hates to sin and loves a sinner. Well, actually, it says his hatred is against the sinner themselves as well. But again, that's another dichotomy because, again, Scripture says there's a generic sense in which he loves sinners, but also hates them. So we ask ourselves, how can God do that? Because that's, that's the first reaction that comes out of the sinful heart. How can God say that? That's not fair. How can God say he loves Jacob, but he hates Esau? So Jacob's going to be saved, Esau's going to be damned. How can he say that? Verse 12, verse 14. What shall we say then? Then he asks the question, there is no injustice with God, is there? In other words, is God unjust in doing this? May dinomai, in the Greek, may it never be. Verse 15, for he says to Moses, uh-oh, we just encountered this earlier. He says, for I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And then verse 16 is really one of the key verses. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who is mercy. That's 100% of the Lord, friends. Salvation is a, is a gift of God's free grace and His love. Verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose. Now listen to this. I just want to give you back, some background. Was Pharaoh a godly man? Was Pharaoh a man who loved the Lord his God? Was Pharaoh a man who had believed in the God of the Hebrews? Absolutely not. He rejected the God of Scripture. He hated God. He rebelled against God. And so listen to what God says. For this very purpose, I raised you up. In other words, 
I let you do this. I let you fall into this sin. I allowed it in my sovereignty to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. And then in verse 18, this is a hard pill to swallow, brother. This is very hard. It took me a very long time to come to accept this. Verse 18, so then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. Now, are we asking the question, well, does God author sin? Does God actually make people sin? Certainly not. So what does he mean by that? When he says, he hardens who he desires. He leaves them to themselves. See, in eternity past, God wasn't doing this, looking at everyone and saying, and everyone's neutral, and he says, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven. That's not, that's not at all what happened. In fact, that would be a, a perversion of what Scripture says. Instead, what does God do? He looks and he sees, who does he see? Does he see righteous people? Does he see neutral people? He sees God haters. He sees people who are going to rebel. He sees people who are going to fall. He sees people who are going to sin against him. And so what he does is he decides out of this great multitude who are going to fall to save some for his own glory. And so he does. He does. And then in verse 19, the next question is asked. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who resists resist his will? In other words, how can God send someone to hell if they've been predestined to it, if they have been set apart for it, how can God, how can they be held accountable for it if God's already set them apart for it? Verse 20. On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? What did we just look at when we heard that? It's not Isaiah. It's the same thing Isaiah says. And guess what? It's the same thing Jude said in Jude 3. It's the same exact thing. The question is not even supposed to be raised because we can't raise it. We can't question God. We cannot. Verse 21, Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? And in ancient days, they would use clay to make all sorts of things for household use. Food, obviously, utensils, etc. But also for when the food left the body. And uh, it had to be deposited somewhere. They would use for the same lump clay for those purposes of the food entering the body and then the food exiting the body. That's what he's saying. Is he honorable and dishonorable? Does God have a right to do that? Absolutely. And then verse 22, listen to this. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Brethren, God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. It says he's bearing with patience those vessels of wrath. In other words, he is bearing patiently with them. Why? Why would God bear patiently with these people if they're going to go to hell? Verse 23, here it is. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. There it is, brother. Why? Why would God allow them to go to hell? To show the glory of his grace to those of us who are going to be brought to heaven. See, the glory of salvation is that much more glorious when you put it in front of the black backdrop of damnation. That's a hard truth to swallow. That's very hard. But God is sovereign. We cannot question that. So a couple of, 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 of common objections, or just common even mis uh, misunderstandings about this. Personally, one of them is raised to, but that just doesn't seem fair, might be one of the, the thoughts that is raised or one of the questions or objections. And as I said earlier, it doesn't matter what it seems to you. God is just. God is sovereign. God is perfect. He can do what He wants. And it really is fair. In fact, you want fair. Okay, this person wants fair. Fair would be no one gets saved and everyone goes to hell. That's fair. In fact, and it saves God the trouble of saving anybody. Saves Christ the sufferings. And yet God in His mercy condescends, comes down and saves sinners. Another one that's raised is, so God saw we were going to believe and then He chose us because of that, right? That's again a misunderstanding of predestination. No, 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 that's not what God, God doesn't look and see, oh, oh, there you go, I see Lucas is going to believe. Okay, come on, Lucas. No, 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 He looks again, as I said, and sees all sinners and He chooses those to believe. Another one, perhaps, is uh, someone might say, I, I do not think 
that is how God really is. It doesn't feel right. It's not really the way that I've heard God portrayed before. I have to be faithful to Scripture, brethren. I just have to, I have to preach the text. In fact, I was speaking with one of you on Sunday, and I, I said, we're talking about this because this is what the text is talking about. I said, when we go to the next part, we're not going to talk about this. <laughs> when we go to verse, uh, next week will be in verse uh, 7 and then 8. We're going to talk about what verses 7 and 8 talk about. See, I'm committed to, again, verse by verse expository preaching. So you're going to hear what the author wanted, to hear, wanted you to hear. You're going to hear what God intended in the text to be said. I can't, I can't twist it. I can't make it even maybe sound more comfortable. I have to give you the truth how it is, and it will transform your life, brother. It will transform your life. Jesus said you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And that is so true even for us as believers. He was speaking to unbelievers, but even as believers, the truth of God's Word transforms our lives. It sets the soul ablaze in the fires of zeal for God and His glory. Um, a, last, uh, a last objection that's raised, and this is something that I, I'm sure none of you would ever even raise, but people will say this in essence. They'll say, perhaps isn't it more that man and God cooperate in salvation? That man, that God does all that he can to tell, that he does 99% and then we just need to activate faith. We need to activate uh, repentance. We need to activate belief. What does Ephesians 2 say? For by grace you have been saved through faith. Okay, there it is, there's faith. But then he says in verse 9, or continuing in verse 8, and that not of yourselves. So where does faith come from? Not ourselves. Verse 9, it is the gift of God, not a result of works. Even the faith we have to believe the gospel is a gift of God. So that argument is, of course, faulty. Ultimately, this exalts God. This exalts the sovereignty and grace of God. But let's continue on in closing as we kind of finish this out. Because we've only made it to uh, just a few, uh, four words. But it says he present, predestined us to adoption as sons. That is so precious, brethren. And I wish I could spend more time on that. But adoption, that God has chosen us to be his children. Uh, as Jesus said in John 3.3, 3, uh, a man is born again to enter God's kingdom. We've been birthed again into the family of God. We have been raised to spiritual life. We've been regenerated. We used to be who? Children of Satan. In fact, uh, Jesus said to the unbelieving Jews in John 8.44, He said, you are of your father, the devil. And you, do, you want to do the desires of your father. But also, what is, what, okay, so we kind of understand in a very generic sense what adoption is. What is adoption in terms of the negative? What is it not? Well, we do not become equal with Christ. That's what some people might say. Well, we become equal with Jesus. No, no, he is the only begotten. We're not begotten. See, Jesus, and what that means when it says begotten, it doesn't mean that there's a certain time in which Jesus came into existence. What it means by begotten is that Christ is of the same nature of the, as the Father. He's of the same essence of the Father. In fact, in John 10, he says in verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So whose hand are they in? He said, me, and then he said, the Father. It's both. There's one God. Yet two, two distinct persons, but one being of God. So we are, we, are, we are possessed by the Father and the Son and the Spirit. That's a very Trinitarian passage. Verse 30 says, I and the Father are one, of the same nature and essence. The fact that God would even condescend to do this, to adopt us, is, prof is profound in and of itself. Absolutely profound. The grace of God is overwhelming. It is abundant. In fact, I can't begin to really grasp the glory of God's grace as it's revealed to toward us in Christ. Sadly, brother, I was not able to even get through really half of what I wanted to. Uh, and I think that just shows the depth of Scripture in God's Word, but so I guess we'll have one more week of... of but it, verse 6 really is just talking about God's glory. Um, and so maybe we can do a whole study on that and, and survey Scripture. But I apologize for that. You know, At least you know that we exhausted the text. That is, that we kind of squeezed the lemon as hard as we could to get every drop out. Uh, I want to get the nutrients out of the text. So with, with that said, we'll, we'll, 
we'll bring it to a close. But certainly, brethren, be encouraged by these truths. May your soul be uh, profoundly, profoundly encouraged. And may you be strengthened in the love of God. Think just think about that love this evening. In fact, I encourage you, perhaps if, if you're going to be busy the rest of the night, as you're just laying in bed to go to sleep, just let your mind wander to think about that fact that God has set His love upon you. Not because there was anything you had to offer. Not because there was any foreseen goodness in you. But because of His free grace. It's free grace. It's not bound grace. It's not a grace that, oh well, you know, this person's good so i got to give them grace. That's not grace. Free grace. It's the grace of God who has shown His glorious grace for us in Christ. And so it is to Him that we ascribe glory and honor as verse 6 does which we will certainly be able to behold next week. So let's close in prayer. Father, please just seal these words upon our hearts and minds. Father, may we be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And Lord, I ask if any of us are perhaps struggling with these truths. I, I know that many Christians do. And I know that many of my, my dear brethren um, have a hard time understanding and grasping these things. I know I myself do. These are beyond my comprehension. I just pray that if anyone has any issues or any, anything that they would like to discuss, I pray that they would be um, feel very free to, to come and talk with me and we can, we can walk through it. Um, and I just want to be faithful to your word, Father. I want to be faithful to your truth. I want to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. And Father, uh, even if it costs me uh, much, uh, I know that your word is worth standing for and standing upon. And so I just ask, Lord, that there will be... Uh, a spirit of grace and unity among us as we discuss these things. And uh, Lord, I'm excited. I love to, to hear and to be in theological conversations because what we're talking about you, this, we're, we're growing in our knowledge of you, Lord, and who you are and who uh, you have revealed yourself to be in your word. And so, Father, we, we praise you for your precious love that you have set upon us. And Lord, I just thank you for your, your word. It is so deep. I mean, I cannot believe that we got through really a little over four words. Father, that your word is just amazing. Uh, it, it's like as if every word is a, is a window that, that, that swings open when we look at it. And we, are, we enter into this house that is just filled with treasures of truth. And so, Father, we just praise you ultimately that all this uh, is in Christ. Our predestination is in Christ. Our, our love that we have set upon us by you is in Christ. And so it is in Christ alone that we boast this evening. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.